king of the universe who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May Yehovah make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name, the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. Are we ready? We who live in the shelter of Elyon spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague that roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open, and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent, for he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. They will carry us, their hands, so that we won't trip on a stone. We will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents, and we will trample underfoot. And because he loves me, I will rescue him. Because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. I will satisfy him with long life. Show him my salvation, says the Lord. Amen. He is good. We're going to be reading from Deuteronomy and then from Psalms chapter 42 and then from the Brit Kadashal, Luke chapter 6, 21. And Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 4 says, Hear, O heavens, as I speak, listen, earth, to the words from my mouth. May my teaching fall like rain. May my speech condense like dew, like light rain on blades of grass or showers on growing plants. For I will proclaim the name of Adonai. Come, declare the greatness of our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A trustworthy God who does no wrong, he is righteous and straight. Psalms 42, 1 through 5, the scripture says, <clears throat> Just as a deer longs for running streams, Yehovah, I long for you. I'm thirsty for Yehovah, for the living God. And when can I come and appear before Yehovah? My tears are my food day and night, while all day people ask me, Where is your God? I recall as my feelings well up within me, how I'd go with the crowd to the house of God with sounds of joy. Praise from the throngs observing the festival. In Luke 6, 21, how blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be filled. Now blessed are you who are crying now, for you will laugh. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth that everlasting life in our midst. And blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Someone shout, fire! Now you can be seated. <laughs> it's a Holy Ghost fire, not a real fire. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you know, we've been, again, we've been talking about fire. We've been talking about revival. We've been talking about 
what we want. We've had some a season of prayer on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we're still open for prayer at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings. And <clears throat> so we really want what God wants. There's a shifting and a changing that's happening in our world, in our society, in our culture, in our government. All around us, we see there is a difference. Something's happening. What I would really like, and I believe what God really wants, is that there would be a shifting in the house of Jehovah, that there would be a difference. You know, we want that revival, but there are some things, I believe, in our lives that hinder us from really becoming and experiencing a revival of fire of God. And it's not because God is trying to withhold anything from us. It's because we have to get ourselves in a position, and I say it all the time, a position to receive. There's a simple answer to one of the reasons why we're not where we should be. <clears throat> I'm thankful that I'm farther than I was, but I don't want to kind of just sit back and say, oh, look what I was. Now I am. I, I'm stretching, reaching for the prize of the high calling. To me, when he says high calling, that kind of means like you can have other things in your life. You can have a low calling, a medium calling, or you can go for the high calling. You know, we can sad, be satisfied with this kind of status quo of our lives, or we can really just throw it all away and go for the gold. So there's a simple answer that we should understand, that we <clears throat> don't have people who have prepared themselves to pay the price that the apostles have paid. And I stand here maybe as one of them, and I know that you can also say that you are one of them because <clears throat> we have gathered things, we have accepted things, we have brought ourselves to a place that there are a lot of things that are hard to give up. You know, the apostles sold everything, right? <clears throat> and... And whoever came uh, under their ministry, um, they sold everything. And again, I, I'm not someone who says we need to sell everything and live together because you know, we can't get along twice a week. I don't know how we could do it every day. But, but what I'm saying is the understanding of what that means. And, and I think the underlying thing of what that means is they would not allow anything that this world had to offer them, stop them from the kingdom and pro proclamation of the word of God in their life. And we have to look at the price that has to be paid. We do not have at this moment a, a group of people. And again, there's so many things in our lives, and maybe because of the culture of society, I don't know. But without that kind of a firm believer, then the community can never be changed until we change our thinking. This is yours. This is mine. Right? Listen, we want to gain favor with people. We, we want obedience to be optional in our lives. We, we justify our lack of standard quite simply because it costs so much. <clears throat> when we read the Word of God that says, you know, uh, hatred, you, you know, you have to hate your mother, you have to hate your father. And we, we look at that as an extreme thing. But what, what he's saying is, of course, we know he says honor and we, of course, we know he says the love. So he's, you know, not saying that. What he's saying is, is that he has to be number one over anything so that even at the end of the day, it looks like if someone needs something, wants something, <clears throat> wants you to do something, go somewhere, participate in something, you can't do it because you love someone more than anyone else. So we have to be careful because there's some things in our lives that, that hinder us. And the first thing is that we have some pride that needs to be gotten rid of. Pride keeps us from honing ourselves and becoming absolutely desperate for Yehovah. <clears throat> because what pride does is pride assumes that you have everything you need. And maybe because you're not lacking and maybe because you're not wanting and maybe because you can go to the store and buy what you want and get in your car and go where you want. Maybe because you can get in a car. Maybe because you are at a home and you can flip on a switch for air conditioning and flip on a switch for heat. And you can go to a refrigerator and you can gather some things that you want. Maybe not the things that you always want because you have children in your house. 
which just means when you thought you wanted to get milk, there was no milk left. When you thought you wanted to get something, it was gone. But that, <clears throat> that's small things. That's small potatoes. But we have this availability, and then we get this false sense of security that we don't need anything. And so we just say, I don't need to go there to get anything from you. Oh, well, I have enough. I have, a, <clears throat> I have a church. I have a community. I have a nice place to go. I can go when I want. I don't have to go when I want. I can worship when I want. I can praise him when I want. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. Because we have everything. And that pride stops us. Because what we have to realize is that pride is a spirit. And pride's goal is to wage war against your desperation. If I can just give it to you, I can just give it to you, I can just give it to you, I can make you feel comfortable. Here's to make you feel comfortable. Here's to make you feel comfortable. You will always put your head in the sand because you're comfortable. You will never see that nothing, something has to change because you're comfortable. <clears throat> until, until we realize that that spirit of pride is coming against us, waging war against our desperation, and it makes us then more aware of how you might look than what you could experience from just one Moment in the presence of Yehovah. Most of you got up and you looked in the mirror when you were ready to leave and you said, I look okay. Right? There's not, most of you got out and you had maybe something in your hair, something in your teeth, something you said, ah, I'll, I'll go anyway. <clears throat> you made sure you looked half decent, didn't you? Or you just like uh, throw things to the wind, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> And the thing is that you have to realize that <clears throat> I need to have this desperation in my life, and i got to make sure that this pride does not wage war against me because pride makes you see things differently, and it makes you look at the sights and sounds of revival, and those things become more offensive to you because it's not the normal for you. You see someone running, I'll never run like that. You see someone praise extravagantly, I will never praise like that. You see someone dancing, I don't need to do all that to be where God wants me to be. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> Why wouldn't you want to praise him? Why wouldn't you want to run for him? Why wouldn't you want to give him praise? Because I guarantee you, when you were in the world, you did it a whole lot. So pride becomes this kind of roadblock that prevents us from experiencing what really Yehovah wants us to experience because you know better. It's increasing because now we have a generation that knows better than anybody. This is because pride assumes that man's definition and understanding of Yehovah is in some ways superior, and it's not. His ways are higher than mine. His thoughts are are higher than mine. His ways are different than mine. I don't know <clears throat> everything. Turn to someone and say, you don't know everything. You don't know everything. We like to pretend that we do. We want everyone to think that we do. You know, as a, as a preacher, you know, coming through the ranks, you know, people used to ask questions, and <clears throat> you felt like as you're a preacher, you had to give, like, fumble through an answer because you just couldn't say, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, you know, you'd be like, well, you know, I believe. And then you go around and, you know, and then you just would present something. And you saw that in their face they had no idea what you were saying for the simple reason because you had no idea what you were saying. The only thing you wanted them to do is to move on. Right? Just <laughs> move on. Because pride would stop you from saying, well, you know what? I don't know. Because their response would be, well, I thought you were a preacher. Well, maybe you thought wrong, but I am a preacher. <clears throat> the thing is, we don't know everything. And there's some things we have to study and some things we have to go back and some things we just, listen, <clears throat> moms and dads, did you know everything before you had a child? Well, guess what? Do you know everything now that you had a child? Hallelujah. And when your children are all gone, will you know everything about your child? No. When will you know everything? You will never, ever know everything. And in fact, the thing is, the older you get, the less you realize you know. You just don't say it. Even though we have access to great theological knowledge, more than we've ever had in our whole entire <clears throat> history, 
what does God call us and what does God want us to be? Children. Children. We know today that our children know, and I, and I don't mean this like knowledge-wise, they, <clears throat> they know more than we knew when we were young. You know, I was playing, you know, uh, jumping off ramps at 12, 13. I, I didn't, wasn't thinking about the way people think, young people think today. We were hide and seek, bloody bones. What age were we? Well, we were, you know, like preteen. We weren't thinking about anything else that young people were thinking about today. And praise the Lord, because we didn't have the burden of having to think about all those things. We were just skipping along life, just climbing a tree, falling out, hitting people, jumping on people, scaring, you know what I'm saying? But today, it's a whole different thing. <clears throat> so they're expected to receive things and gain things that really they should not gain and receive. Because they're expected to not be a child. Stay a child as long as you can stay a child. Because when it's time not to be a child, you will wish you were back being a child. Just telling you. Hello. Don't rush it. So to assume that we know everything about how God moves is really the height of arrogance. Because God is going to do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. And what we need to do is just be vessels to receive what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and how he wants to do it. And we cannot allow pride to stop us from letting him do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it with us, how he wants to do it. Another thing that stops us is this fear of man. Now, I know that you're all big and bad and nothing scares you and you take on the world. <clears throat> but fear of man is real in our lives. And how I know that is because if you won't do something in your life unless you've been Fired up. You know, anger can make you do things you wouldn't normally do. And you know why? Because anger removes the fear of man from you. Addiction, you might do something you never would do normally because addiction removes the fear of man from you. You don't care now. Right? So you can be this really quiet person, really reserved. <clears throat> and then, you know, you engage in something and, and, and get a little high, get a little wasted, get a little drunk. And then all of a sudden you are just the life of a party. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> that means that the reason why you're not the life of the party without a substance, without an anger, without a situation, is because you are afraid of man. Hello? Now, don't get mad at me right now, some of you. Because you are afraid, not because they're going to beat you up, not, but you are fearful of how they think of you. And when you have those things in your life that removes that, you don't care what people think of you anymore. And we have to be like the apostles who had such an anointing and were so drunk in the spirit. They no longer cared what man thought. Remember, Peter, <clears throat> are you part of this crowd? <clears throat> Do you serve this man named Yeshua? I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Why? He's fearful of man. But then he gets drunk in the Holy Spirit and he gets filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he comes out and stands on the southern steps and he preaches the gospel like he never preached before. He is no longer afraid. Because it's been removed. And if you are desperate enough for Yehovah, you don't care what people think about you. And the thing is, some of the reasons why we're not sharing the gospel with some people and some things that we're pulling back and not saying and some things that we're afraid to tell the truth about <clears throat> is because you are fearful of what man will think of you. And I got news for you. When you're gone, man don't care about you. Listen, you understand that going deeper in your hole is costly and it is worth whatever price you need to pay. And one way to evaluate our progress in Yehovah is to assess that desperation level of our closest friends. I've had some good friends in my life. <clears throat> if when you have those friends, most of the time you gather friends somewhat think like you. I mean, you have many friends, but I'm talking about close friends. 
correct? <clears throat> Very oddly would it be that they completely think differently than you because you have to have some sort of common ground, right? And I'm not talking about just going out once in a while. You can have people who don't believe and <clears throat> think. But I'm talking about if you are really close-knit, most of them are going to think like you think. If you are simply coasting with Yehovah, not desiring to, to fulfill his purposes for your life, it would seem that you have not become desperate enough because when you are desperate, you start to change people that are around you. If you are in a circle of five, and someone in that circle starts to cry out for revival, for an all-consuming power, I guarantee you that people who invest most intimately and personally into your life will either reflect that cry or leave you alone. Because change is going to take place. And a lot of times when we are hooked, <clears throat> It changes us because we are fearful that we're going to lose some of those close friends if we really propel ourselves to be what God wants us to be. When you go after Yehovah, you may lose close friends because they are satisfied living at a level that now you no longer want to live at. They want to live comfortably, and your fire brings discomfort to them and so unless you succumb to their discomfort and say, well, I'm sorry, let me just you know, slow down. I understand where you're at and I can't push you. Here's the thing. <clears throat> if, you, if you wanted them to have something really bad, you don't care whether you're pushing them or not. The only time you care is when you really are trying to get God and they don't want you to get God the way that you want to get God. You will either surrender to their comfort or they will walk away. Listen, it doesn't matter what people think. If you don't pursue Yehoah based on what other people are doing or not doing, you pursue Yehoah because you want to. It's the same thing with, um, you know, <clears throat> a change. Uh, the wife can sanctify the husband. The husband can sanctify the wife. Um, if 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 we try to always appease, then really you start losing your power of what God has for you. How, how is a husband going to be sanctified? How is a wife going to be sanctified? They're not going to be sanctified because there's something <clears throat> that you're bringing to the table that is different than what has been there. And again, there's fear because fear means that someone's going to have to bend. Someone's going to have to yield. And someone's going to have to, because I just want to have this. I just want everything to be comfortable. I don't want, we, we, we don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers. Are you hearing me? I think you're hearing me, but I don't know if you're listening to me. <laughs> I'm sensing like a, a, as I'm waving this out, there's a wave that's coming back and saying, shut up. Oh, go ahead and say no, no, but I hear no amen, amen. I need to take some of my powerful water. You get together. It's a family reunion. You try to keep the status quo. No one ruffle feathers. Please don't talk about religion. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. <clears throat> but here's the thing. Sometimes you got to talk about it. You have to talk about it because it's, it's a choice that we're making to go which way, one way or the other. It's a, it's a choice that you have to make because everyone sitting around that table might not know Yeshua. And if they don't know Yeshua, they're going to hell. And if you really do care about them. <laughs> listen, over the last couple uh, <clears throat> months, you know that you're not guaranteed. Here, here is uh, Minister Tanya, who's 46 years old. Gone in a second. You only have one opportunity. That's the opportunity you have it right this, at this moment, right here, right now. Because you're not guaranteed the next moment. So make that moment count. 
not talking about jump on them, wrestle them. I'm not talking about pin them down. I'm not talking about, <clears throat> you know, sometimes in Africa they just do all that to, you know, get out, devil, get out, devil, and that people try to run away. They chase them down. But I'm talking about an honest, listen, a movement. But you have to want God more than anything, even if it costs you everything. And you have to press past the fear of man because you are desperate for a new taste of Jehovah's glory in your life. And I guarantee you, a taste of God's glory is everything. Desperation says, I don't care what my friends say. I don't care if I lose all my friends. I, I've got to go after Jehovah no matter what. But Pastor, does it mean I'm going to lose them? No, because if you have that much influence on them, you will draw them. But you won't draw them hot and cold. You won't draw them lukewarm. You won't draw them truth and falsehood. You won't draw them by making a stand and then giving in to the stand. You won't draw them. We read Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 through 5. It says, just as a deer longs for running stream, just as a deer panteth for the water. You know what panteth means? It means you're so exhausted and so <clears throat> um, uh, out of hydration that you are longing so much. Has anyone ever worked so much that you just, you just need some good glass of water? As a deer longs for running stream, God, I long for you. That's how it should be. Because I guarantee you, this world takes that out of you. This world takes that out of you. It says, I am thirsty for God, for the living God. When can I come and appear before God? My, my tears are my food day and night. While all, people, <clears throat> while all day people ask me, where is your God? I recall as my feelings well up within me. How I'd go with the crowd to the house of God with sounds of joy and praise from the throngs observing the festival. He's remembering, I'm so thirsty for that time again. I'm so thirsty for more prayer. I'm so thirsty for that outpouring. I'm so thirsty for that joy that I used to have. I'm so thirsty for that <clears throat> celebration that I used to have. But I'm so fearful of man. I was showing the, the kids... I came across something on Facebook. I posted it. <clears throat> it was a Jewish man. He was getting ready for the festival. And uh, there was a song on. So he just started dancing in his kitchen with his food. And you could see that his wife was taking it. And every once in a while, you could hear her giggle like, because <laughs> he was just doing all sorts of things. And I, and I just was thinking about the sermon because what happens is <clears throat> sometimes we would do that in the kitchen. Because you let yourself loose. You, you, know, you know, your wife's laughing. You don't care what your li- wife thinks, right? And you're, you're totally removed that it's on camera and that now millions of people are going to see it. You're just having a good time. And then we get to the house of the Lord. And we're rigid. We can't do it. And there's only one reason why you couldn't do it in the house of the Lord. There's only one reason why you couldn't break out in joy. There's only one reason why you just can't go and maybe you can pick up a chair and start doing all that. It's because why? You are fearful of what these eyes are going to say about you. But here's the thing. You have to get to a point where you say, listen, it's between me and God and God and me. And you may laugh at me and you might think I'm the worst dancer, the have no movement, I, I'm, a, I'm a klutz or whatever, but you know what? I'm not doing it for you. I'm, it's no contest. It's, it's not, you know, the best dancer or the best singer. It's for him. So thankful he said make a joyful noise, and thankful he said just dance before him. He didn't say good. Right? We have to get to the place where we are not fearful of man. And if you want to break out into praise, and I'm sure some of you just say, oh, I just want to praise him. I just want to shout. I just want to scream. I just want to run. And then you look around and you say, no, people love me. As a deer. See, we have to stop living in the shallows. You know the, the Word of God where it talks about <clears throat> the, the river was um, ankle deep. Then it was. Kept going up, then it was knee deep, then it was thigh deep, and then all of a sudden, 
You know, <clears throat> when, you, when you're in shallow water, you can stand on your own. In shallow water, you experience the water, but you're still in control. You can still go where you want, do what you want, uh, whatever you want. It's shallow. You are in control. All of us have been to the beach, and we go <clears throat> just ankle deep, and we're, we're in control unless the ocean starts taking some sand. But you're still in control. You back up, right? And a lot of us like to be in the presence of the Lord, but in a shallow way. Because we want to experience him, we want to feel him, we want the refreshing of it, <clears throat> we want to see it, we want to feel it, we want to understand the movement of it, but we still want to be in control because we are afraid of what someone's going to say. And we have to stop living in those shadows when the Ruach is calling us to go into deeper waters because the deeper the water is, the less control you have. And what controls you? The water. We stay in the shallows because of fear. We stay because our friends are there. We stay because our comfort zones are there. We stay there because our reputation and acceptance is there. They will allow you to have a little bit of God. But don't be crazy. Don't be, and they use this word against you, don't be fanatical. Let me ask you this question. Are any of you ever fanatical in some other area of your life? Is there something in your life that you are fanatical about? Some situation that you like a certain way and you are fanatical about it? And really you start to drive people crazy because you are that fanatical about that situation. But to you it doesn't seem fanatical. It just seems like it's the right thing. Right? The way you do something, where you put something, what's going on. But when it comes to God, we like to live in the shallows. It would be great if there was a newspaper article that said, Lion of Judah, Saturday, people were staggering out of the sanctuary, seemingly drunk. <laughs> You know, you're in a small town, that would happen. You understand? Seemingly drunk and preaching and going to the streets and worshiping. And some of us would be right there and some of us would be looking for the door in the back because you're afraid what people will think of you. But what's most important? How hungry are you for your whole is touching your life? What do you really, really want? Where do you really want to go? And I think another thing that stops us is quite simply probably one of the greatest hindrances in our lives, and that is our toleration of our own sin. I'm not talking about the sin out there. I'm talking about the sin in here. What do we tolerate? This toleration of sin is actually responsible for our strongholds. It's, it's, it's responsible for our addictions. It's responsible for our bondages that we live under because we tolerate something that then binds us. And yet God has set us free, and he who the Son sets free is free indeed. <clears throat> but our tolerance of what we allow in our lives is what is binding us. We don't like it. We know we don't like it. There's not one of us that are engaged in sin, <clears throat> engaged in a situation, engaged in a, in, a, in a bondage or a stronghold that we like it. We are tired of living below instead of above. We know that being enslaved to sin is not Jehovah's best plan for our lives, but it's hard for us to escape it. And the reason why is not because God's not able. It's the thing is that we have this toleration in our lives. The problem is, is that sin has become so familiar to us that we are not quite ready to part with it. You know you can hate something and still like it. Still have it. Because you don't want to, can't want to, don't know how to move on from it. Because it's too familiar to you. 
It's that sweater you've been wearing for 27 years. Every hole in it. And where, when you want to be comfortable, when things are going bad, when, <clears throat> when your mind is uh, you know, in disarray, what do you go to? You go to something that's what? Comfortable, familiar. You don't go and put on something new. You go and you dig in that <clears throat> closet. The back is that moth-eaten cockroach infested and you pull it out and you and you put it on and what do you say to yourself oh i feel better now that's how sin is to us it's almost as if we are afraid to live outside the confines of a prison cell because we have never lived that way before We've been bound for so long, addicted for so long, stronghold for so long. What would it be like to live outside of it? We can't do it. It's that, ch- it's that, <clears throat> that dog that's been on that chain, and they would run 10 feet and be pulled back and pulled back for 20 years, and they get unhooked, and they still only go 20 or 10 foot. They cannot go beyond that because they know what it is. Sustained sin prevents sustained sin. Revival. But desperation looks like that if I want to be released from this, I want to be free from my lust, I want to be free from my drugs, I want to be free from my alcohol, I want to be free from my gossip, I want to be free from my pride, I want to be free from my bondage. I can't live like this anymore. I have to understand this that seems comfortable is killing me. And I have to see who I am and I have to see that if God touches me and what I can be and I have to move beyond what I'm doing and where I'm at and because a touch from him changes everything. And that kind of desperation will position you to break out of your bondage and experience the power of Yehoah, your hunger for you in your life. If you are really, truly desperate, Yehoah will not disappoint you. People have said, <clears throat> eat this, and you go and you get excited, and you eat that, and you're like, it's not what you said it was. Go here, I mean, go see this movie, and you're like, oh, it's a great movie, man, you're in it, and you go. And they're like, mm, what was, I don't understand the movie. But you'll never be dissatisfied with Yeshua. If you're hungry, he will lead you to the banqueting table. He's not going to make you hungry the rest of your life. Listen, if you're hungry, it's because he made you hungry. Do you know why you are hungry right now and want to go to the Oneg and eat something? It's not because you are hungry. It's because God has placed within you hunger. You have a mechanism that he created within you so that you would not go without food. Now, I know it seems to be impossible that I would, would I ever go without food? <clears throat> but he, he has this hunger in you that if you get to the place where before your body starts to tear down, before your body starts to eat itself, before your body starts to, <clears throat> to die, there's a hunger that rises up in you because it's a mechanism. And that hunger was placed there by God. Your spiritual hunger is there because God wants you to be hungry. And so he's placed it in you. So he I never thought about that. I never want to do that. But there's a moment when you're saying, I think I want God. That's God putting hunger in you because he wants you. He desires you. He he loves you so much. He puts it inside of you. You're not hungry spiritually on your own. Leave to your own devices. Your heart is wicked. Deceitfully wicked at that. Leave to your own devices. You don't care about God. But God puts a hunger in you. He's the one who deposited the hunger in you from the very beginning. I'm hungry because he wants me to be hungry. I'm hungry because he has food for me. I'm hungry because he loves me enough to make me hungry. So even when you're convicted, even though you don't know what's going on, but you, you want God, and even though you're pulled by the world, because that want God means that God is wanting you. In Luke 6, 21, he said, how blessed are you who are hungry. What will happen to you if you're hungry? You will be filled. And how blessed are you who are crying now? What's going to happen to you? You're going to start to laugh. 
Listen. He's not going to make you hungry and then not feed you. I can't make you hungry. I can preach. I can teach. I can try to inspire. I can try to do whatever I can do. But I can't make you hungry. Not at all. The most perfect sermon will not make you hungry. I can do illustrated sermons, which I've done before, <clears throat> and that won't make you hungry. You can enjoy them. You might think they're very nice. You might think they're very powerful, but it will not make you hungry. I know that over these 35 years or even more than 35 years preaching before this church because there have been <clears throat> great sermons and great moments and great outpourings, and yet it will not make you hungry until God places Hunger in you. And I believe that we are in a position, a time of society and culture, a moment of time before he comes. I don't know when he's coming, but he is coming. He's been coming for a long time, but he's still coming. But I believe he's placing a hunger in us, and I believe the hunger is for a reason, and that's to fill us. It makes no sense to have a hunger and not be fed. It makes no sense to have a hunger and not go where the banquet table is. It makes no sense if you're hungry to stand away from the table when someone is inviting you. Are you hungry? You look hungry. You act hungry. <clears throat> you, 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 you know you're hungry. You're drooling. And yet there's a table and you continue saying no. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. You know why you're saying no? Because pride is stopping you. You know why you're saying no? Because the fear of man and how you eat and how you come is stopping you. You know why you're saying no? Because you're still allowing your sin not to allow you to come to the table. But come to the table. Because he can get rid of your sin. He can get rid of your fear of man. And pride can be taken away. I can't preach you into hunger. I can't teach you into hunger. <clears throat> All of you who are parents, you understand that every child makes their own decision no matter how many times you lock them in a closet. No matter how many times you beat their butt. No matter how many times you scream and yell at them, at the end of the day, they continue to make their own decision. Doesn't mean that you just throw your hands up and say, then you won't do it, because you do the best you can to get in what you can get in while you can get in, but you all know it's still their decision. That's what's so frustrating about it. Right? You just say, if I could just get into your brain and get you to understand this truth. But here's the thing. <clears throat> that was how your mother did, too. Now you look at your mother, I don't know what's going on. She knows what's going on. We all know what's going on. I can't make you hungry. You can't make your children hungry. I can't make my wife hungry. She can't make me hungry. I can't make my friends hungry. I can't make you hungry by teaching, by preaching, by inspiring you. Only God. So if you have a moment of hunger, know that it is God trying to pull you. Jehovah starts to make you hungry, you won't be able to shake it until you're filled. That's the key. Because it's a spiritual thing. It's not a mind thing. We think if we can just change their minds. It's not a carnal thing. If we can just eradicate some things in their lives. It's not a hype thing or excitement. If we can just hype this up enough and get so excited enough. But I've been in services where I'm just as excited. I can hardly stand it. I'll explode the next time I say hallelujah. And then I open my eye and people are looking like you crazy. And I'm like, ain't you getting my excitement? I'm excited. You should be getting excited. I'm hyped up. <clears throat> and have you ever been around someone who's hyped up and excited and everyone else is like, what are, is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? So you know it's not a mind thing. It's not a carnal thing. It's not a hype or excitement thing. I can't work it up. But it's a deep interior work of the Ruach that's moving on your heart. And he's the only one capable of igniting. And he's the only one able to sustain a burning hunger within you. 
And if you just have just a moment, a fleeting second of hunger, that's him. Come to the table. Because I guarantee his table is filled with a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff that will fill you up. We have this rehearsal every single week. We go to the Oneg and there's chicken and and chicken and salads and casseroles and beef and beef hot dogs and <coughs> such really delicious food that you all brought in. Right? What a what a wonderful ability to just come and we have this that we come to the table. So if you left tonight hungry, whose fault is it? I mean, if there's nothing left but a piece of challah bread, hallelujah. You can be filled a little bit if you just go and get a cupcake first. Like some of you people do. Head for the sweets first, then go back for the food. So if you go home hungry, it's no one's fault but your own. And I believe God has set a table today, and I believe he's putting hunger in you, and I believe that if we would yield to that hunger, pride would be dismissed from our lives. Fear of man would be dissolved, and sin would find its way out. And when all that goes, it's the glory of Yehovah. Amen? Amen? Are you hungry? As a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. Hallelujah. Let's stand before Yehovah. He's a good God. See, it's just 1 o'clock. My inner calendar, my inner clock always tells me when it's 1 o'clock. We're going to bring the Torah out. The Torah, when I bring it out, I'm going to bring it to the center. Is it time for you just to dance around? Just come and walk around it if you can. If you don't know how to dance, just walk around it. Walk around and, like, shake an elbow. <clears throat> if you want to hold the Torah, you're more than welcome to hold it. Just look at me enduringly, and I will... Hand you the Torah. The Torah is a heavy thing, so you can hold it as long as you hold it. <clears throat> and I'll be right there with you. Your daddy will be right there with you, making sure you don't drop the Torah. Please don't drop the Torah. And we're just going to do that for just a, a, a song or two, and then we'll pray for the young people. Amen. <clears throat> because it's the changing of, of the Torah portion. Men and tradition, you know, you are priest, and you are to um, be the lead, so be the lead. Come and dance around the Torah, and uh, take a turn to hold the Torah. Hallelujah. Let's stand before the Lord as we bring the Torah out. Ha! Uh -huh. 
of the canopy. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. The word of the Lord is truth. Father. Father, we thank you and praise you for each child representing this prayer show. Little, large, young, older. We thank you, Lord, that, Father, they will be a Sarah, a Rachel, a Leah, a Rebecca. A Ephraim, a Manasseh, a Joseph, a Peter, a Paul, an Esther, a Miriam. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for their life and for what they mean to you. We ask, God, that you will lead them, guide them, and direct them into your all truth. Let them serve you as the Messiah. Let them worship you in spirit and in truth. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you will undo the works and snares of the enemy in their lives. And, Father, they will be preachers and teachers and prophets and intercessors and shepherds, Father, Lord, they will be evangelist, and Father, Lord, their feet will go where you want them to go. We give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Lift up your <coughs> hands and close your eyes, because who is looking? Not you, that's true, but Yehovah is looking. So make sure you close your eyes, because he's looking at you, okay? <coughs> if you can't close your eyes, put your hands over your eyes to help you as we say the blessing. Yevarekh Yehovah, he who exists, kneel before you, presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will eliminate the wholeness of being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be, whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests, save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See you in the Oneg. I'll bring the T-shirt uh, <clears throat> paper to there if you want to buy.